I want to talk about wealth inequality in this country and capitalism and, of course, stakeholder capitalism, something I know that you care very deeply about. So kind of just stepping back again and looking big picture, um, we have certainly seen, uh, you know, markets just rip and we wonder, you know, what does that do and how does that exacerbate the wealth inequality in this country? And what do you think needs to be done to, to flatten the curve, if you will, of growing inequality? Well, we've obviously got this huge disconnect between Main Street and Wall Street. Uh, and there's so many data points along us. I mean, we, we've since July, I think we have 8 million more people in poverty than we had just in the last six months, despite the recovery that we've had. Um, those that are the most vulnerable have suffered the most. And until we get the vaccine, we'll probably continue uh, along that path. So listen, the, 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 the private economy is 20 trillion and then the government's four and a half trillion and then public philanthropy is probably 350, 400 billion. So private philanthropy, I mean, excuse me. So the, the corporate sector, the private sectors, 40 times the size of, of philanthropy and it's uh, four and a half times the size of U.S. government. So if we're going to have true social change. It has to start in the private sector. That's where you're going, I think, to actually begin to deal with wealth inequality. Of course, at Just Capital, we poll every year and ask the Americans, what's the most important thing to corporate justness towards making a company good? And the answer comes back year after year after year. Number one thing is, do you pay a fair and living wage? Do you pay someone a wage that allows them with a partner to raise a child and not struggle, but str but but thrive, not strive, but thrive? So I think we've labored under this. I think it's a false God and a false belief that we have to pay low wages in order for companies to survive and to prosper. I think actually, if you raise the wage level, uh, across all workers, it's quite possible that the whole pie gets bigger and that we have the same level of profitability for companies, but we have a much stronger and more productive uh, economy than what we have now. So we started this initiative um, called the Financial Wellness Audit, which we're encouraging companies to do. And here's a statistic that I don't think everyone really knows, which is of the 20 million workers for the 1,000 largest companies in the United States, 10 million of those do not make an income with their partner working part time to be able to support a living wage for a family of three. And that just, again, I don't think that's really what the American dream's about. So one thing we're encouraging companies to do is do a financial wellness audit find out how many of your employees are making below a living wage. And then when it comes time every year to allocate the revenues, how much of corporate revenues should go towards dealing with employees that you have making less than a living wage versus how much should be allocated to shareholders. And that's a really, I think, important moral question that every board should deal with, that every shareholder should deal with, which is if I'm not paying someone a living wage, and certainly if I'm not paying them a poverty wage, which would be a another be a subset of that 10 million number, probably three million number, probably three million to 20, then who is paying for that? Well, who's paying for it, Julie, is you and I, taxpayers. Companies are actually using taxpayer subsidies to be able to generate their own profitability. And again, there's there's a there's a large question as to whether that's either good economic policy and whether that's really morally correct. So I think the first most important thing is for everyone to know how many of your employees don't make a living wage and then what's your responsibility to them along those lines. I think it's a great question for every board, every every person in senior management 
Uh, is it, uh, aren't our workers who are actually allowing us to provide these products and services, aren't they the most important lifeblood? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Paul, I'm a millennial and you were mentioning um, you're a father of millennial age children as well. And you know, our views, uh, it, broadly speaking, as a generation, I'm sure you've seen the polls on the views of, of capitalism. And I, I do want to kind of ask you about the consequences. And the reason I wanted to have this conversation, it, it goes back to a TED talk you gave five years ago. And if you, you don't mind, I'm just going to quote you really quickly. You said, quote, now here's a macro forecast that's easy to make and that that's that the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest, it will get closed. History always does it. It typically happens in one of three ways, either through revolution, higher taxes, or wars. None of those are on my bucket list. What is your macro forecast for that today? And are, are we headed in the right direction? Well, well, this election obviously was gonna, it, it looked like we were at, at one point along the way for a revolution. Who knows what's happening with the election? Um, and certainly the, the stuff that we saw in the streets this summer was unlike anything that we've seen in, in since the late 60s. And then, of course, if you look at the Biden tax plan, which for all we know, come January 6th, may ultimately get enacted. Um, and the Biden tax plan is probably takes an absolute dead eye bullseye on the one percent. Uh, and does a great job of redistributing that to the rest of Main Street. So I don't know what the economic consequences are. I know what the distributed properties of it are. Uh, so we could be along that path of high, high taxes. We won't know until January. And then as far as wars go, again, these are crazy times where politicians seem to be jumpy, uh, where things seem to be so discombobulated that um, who knows what the future brings. Um, and again, a war can be a consequence of, a war can be a consequence of a variety of things. It's possible a war could be a consequence because there's so much uh, divisiveness at home is the easiest way for whoever the politician charge is to get people to look the other direction. So I still think, again, that gap's going to be closed. It's probably going to be one of those three avenues, which one I can't pick. If I had to put my money on one, well, look, we're 50-50 on higher taxes. So uh, that, that could literally be, well, we'll know more in January. Can we kind of double click on that just a little bit? Uh, I just kind of philosophically, how do you think about um, the deficit and higher taxes? Deficit? Who, who, who ever talks about that anymore? I mean, that's it's, it's funny. Um, I haven't heard the word deficit. The only time I uh, hear the word deficits when I talk to all my macro brethren who simply will sit there and say uh, it's just a matter of time before we pay the piper for the egregious debt levels that we built up nationally as well as internationally. So far though, it seems like the trees can go to the sky, that there is no limit. Um, certainly debt to GDP globally continues to make new highs year after year after year. And now we've gone, gone, given up even trying, I think, to have any semblance of fiscal responsibility in terms of tackling it. Um, so at some point, I guess, will the markets will find there'll be some weak point, there'll be some grease of the future that creates enough systemic shock to where governments will have to deal with austerity budgets. I don't know when that's going to be. Um, we've been on this path literally for three decades, and it continues to do more than I thought was even remotely possible in terms of people's tolerance for uh, fiscal impropriety. Paul Tudor Jones, the founder and CIO of Tudor Investment Corporation, of course, also the co-founder of Just Capital and co-founder of the Robin Hood Foundation. I thank you so much for such a fascinating conversation and for being so generous with your time. Julia, you're, you're very kind, very sweet. I hope you have a blessed and all your listeners have a blessed holiday season.